And uh, I think I should probably preface my official talk with just some background words here. I'm a cosmologist, but at the same time in my adult life, I'm constantly hearing the words of my father in my ear, which was maybe several times a day, Sandra, make yourself useful. That was, that was the refrain in our house. And uh, you have to wonder really, is cosmology useful information? It's certainly interesting, but is it kind of like a Beethoven symphony? something that's entertaining briefly, maybe even inspiring, but we listen to it and then we go back to business as usual. Or is it knowledge that's much more fundamental and needs to be integrated into our very way of thinking about ourselves? And I'd like to think that cosmology is of the latter type. It's really something that everybody needs to understand in order to even understand themselves and where Earth and human beings on it are going. So I'm gonna tell a cosmological story at the beginning, but you should think about it as foundation for the second part of my talk, which is trying to respond to my dad's refrain, make yourself useful. What do we do with this information? Okay, so with that as a little bit of an introduction, let me share my screen and get my talk going. Good. Skipping over here to my PowerPoint. I think I am. It's lurking. Let's see here. Here we go. Excellent. Of course, the, the challenge is giving talks this way. We'll Will the slides advance? And they don't. Uh, Sandy, I find that if you click on the picture, it, it uh, activates the advance. There we go. Yep. yep. Thank you. That was great advice. All right. So, um, as I said, I'm uh, going to start with the story of cosmology. And here are my main points. We understand Earth's history in broad outline. And the lesson is that we live or die by the laws of physics. And in sort of incidentally, the biggest threat to life on Earth is not asteroids or something like that. It's volcanism. Um, but even so, our cosmic future is bright. And we probably have 100 or to hundreds of millions of years of future habitability, and maybe even astronomy is telling us that Earth is extremely rare in our galaxy. So preserving Earth's future is a critical moral decision facing us right now. And unfortunately, there's no global consensus on three crucial issues, the economic system we need to use, basic principles for managing Earth and governing ourselves, and most important of all, why is Earth's long-term health important to us, to the universe, to anybody. So contemplating Earth's future on cosmic time puts these questions into proper perspective and helping to answer them is the goal of this new Earth Futures Institute at UC Santa Cruz. And so at the end of my talk, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about EFI. Okay, so let's plunge in. Uh, Let's go back to a time of 10 to the minus 35 seconds, <clears throat> right after the official Big Bang, and a temperature of 10 to the 27 degrees Kelvin, unmanageable conditions. We need physics to help us think about these things. <clears throat> the Earth was, the universe was extremely hot, it was extremely dense, and in a magical way, really, it was expanding faster than the speed of light for a brief interval. Speed of light expansion has the consequence of generating density fluctuations, which I'm trying to represent here on this slide. And density fluctuations back then, at that early time, they set up the conditions for the formation of galaxies <clears throat> hundreds of millions of years later because in an expanding universe, if you have a density peak, 
there's extra gravity there drawing things into it. And when matter is drawn in, the peak grows. By the same token, a density valley lacks gravity, can't hang on to the stuff in the expansion and loses its material to the peaks. So there's a general flow of matter from valleys onto peaks. And that's really how the galaxies that we see today, how they got started in the first place. All right, so um, <clears throat> it would be nicer to be able to visualize this. And fortunately, there are simulations that make the process visible. This one was made by some folks in Japan 15 years ago. The blue stuff that you see here is gas. That's the original stuff of the Big Bang. And the gas is falling into lumps. It has an unusual pattern that's kind of filamentary. And then galaxies form, at, especially at the intersections of these filaments. And you can see that the early process here is very, very chaotic. Proto-galaxies are colliding. The blue stuff is forming into stars. The stars are the little white dots. And every time one of these proto-galaxies collides with another, it gets disrupted and all the stars that had previously formed got thrown, get thrown into sort of a spheroidal shape. Now, as time goes on, the universe is getting less dense. It's getting more diffuse and the collisions are getting less probable because objects are moving apart from one another. They're not interacting as much. And so over time, this chaotic phase of early collisions, it passes and we're left more with isolated objects that are settling down into some stable equilibrium morphology. That's what we see here. So what we see here is predict a two component morphology for galaxies. All the early stars that were formed before the last collision are thrown into a halo. We call it a spheroid, centrally concentrated. And then the last gas that falls in that's undisrupted makes a disk and turns into stars, okay? So now why would we believe that? Because this picture matches rather well the, the appearances of galaxies that we can actually see today. Let's see if I can get my slides to advance, okay? So here are some pictures of galaxies seen face on, the disk is, is face on, and we can see that dense central core comprised of the stars that were made early and thrown into a spherical distribution by collisions. And um, we can see that galaxies actually occupy sort of a sequence, more and more disk, late disk form versus early core spheroidal formation. It's called the Hubble sequence. Now we're going along the sequence to galaxies that were more isolated and less disrupted during their formation. And we know that they're disks because we can see some of the objects edge on and the gas and dust, the interstellar dust, I'll come back to that, is created inside supernova and the atmospheres of cool stars and thrown out into the interstellar medium where it's available to be incorporated into new stars. And sometimes we see that layer of dust edge on, it's highly opaque, um, but when, uh, and when we see it edge on, we can see a thin layer there, emphasizing the fact that these are flattened rotating systems. <clears throat> so here's a particularly beautiful example of a nearby galaxy of this form. Here's the, the, the early family of stars here, making the spheroidal system and then the outer disk formed later. And we even see that this is a good model for our own galaxy. We can take wide angle pictures of the Milky Way in a dark sky site. And here's, here's the center of the galaxy here. And here's the disk of the galaxy. And we have our own dark dust clouds in our object. I'm gonna come back to the dust later. It's very important. 
Another reason why we think we have the story is that we have instruments like the Hubble telescope, powerful telescopes that look out in space. But when you look out in space, you're also looking back in time because it takes a little while for the light to get to you. And so a picture like this with 10,000 galaxies in it taken by Hubble, you can think of it as a sort of core drilling of not, out, not only out into space, but also back in time. It's layers in time. And if you can estimate the distance of the galaxy away from you, you know how far back in time you're looking. And in that way, we piece together the formation of galaxies, sort of like integrating and synthesizing the layers of an onion. We try to put them together causally, one onion slice related to the next. And again, our pictures of galaxies that we generate this way through observations, they really agree with the theoretical picture that I just outlined. Now, let me just take a little detour at this point. Um, there's a company that I absolutely adore. It's called despair.com and it makes posters. Maybe you've seen some of their posters, ironic posters that um, have the exact opposite intended effect from, uh, from what you think they might. So here's a, an example of a despair poster. Opportunity, just because your ship came in, doesn't mean you're going places. And they, they have dozens of these. They're all very funny, I think. To some people, the Hubble deep field that we were just looking at might inspire a despair poster that looks like this. Astronomy, finding out you really just don't matter. <laughs> There are, you know, 10,000 galaxies in that field. There are 100 billion of them over the entire celestial sphere. Ours is just one. How could we possibly be important? Well, hold that thought because it's really one of the major points of my talk to argue just the opposite from this. Let's move on though in our cosmic story. We've made galaxies. Galaxies are the place where stuff happens because their gravity has brought gas together at high density, and you can make stars and planets there, okay? So uh, let's now talk a little bit about planet formation. In one of our neighbors here, there is a glowing region of gas, which I'm blown up here. This is the Hubble Space Telescope picture of it. And if you look closely, you can see in the middle a cluster of newly formed stars, very luminous, maybe a million times brighter than the sun. And they're very hot. Their energetic radiation excites, their birth clouds causes them to glow. So this is what we would call as astronomers, a stellar nursery. And we can see them all over our own galaxy and also in other galaxies. Fortunately, we have one very close by it's called the Orion Nebula. This uh, cloudy, cloudy structure below the belt, the so-called sword, is not stars. It's really a glowing gas cloud. And Hubble has imaged it at very, very high resolution. This is a montage of many Hubble pictures. And you can see that this nebula has a lot of structure in it, has a lot of dark dust, right? And if we were to blow it up, we'd see tiny little points, dark little uh, circular looking structures silhouetted against the glowing gas. Here are some blown up. These are young ones. These are solar systems in the process of formation. And you can see the young star forming here. It's still surrounded by its nebular birth cloud. You can see with this one, a flattened ring is, is attempted to settle and appear here. And this is what they look like later in life. There's a whole family of them, around 50 of them in the Orion Nebula. And late in life, you can see the, the, the central star surrounded by a dust disk structure looking sort of ellipsoidal. Sometimes they're face on, sometimes they're edge on. And that's why we know that again, we're looking at disky structures. This one is quite large, 17 times the radius or diameter of Pluto's orbit. So these are big structures. And we think that they're nascent um, proto-solar systems in formation. Now, 
This dark dust that you see here is the same dust that we saw silhouetted in clouds in the galaxy as a whole. And when it settles here into a rotating disk, that's what makes planets because these little dust grains, individually, they're just the size of cigarette, a grain of cigarette smoke. They're sticky. And when concentrated in a nebula, they begin to stick together and they make rocky asteroids and protoplanets that form the cores of big planets like Jupiter, but also terrestrial planets like Earth. So this is, those dust grains, when you go out and pick up a rock, what you're doing is picking up dust that was once scattered throughout the galaxy and came together to make our planet here, synthesized in supernova explosions and blown out later to be incorporated into our very own solar system. So here's a picture of what a rotating protosolar nebula might look like. And here are asteroidal-like rocky uh, objects that are coalescing, drawing in yet more material to make a planet. I love this picture, which sort of sums up the whole story of the formation of the solar system. In the foreground, we see a beautiful rocky landscape in a cave in Arizona. And here's a Native American kiva here, made of rocks. And in the background here, we see the center of the galaxy and the center of the Milky Way showing the dust clouds, which actually coagulated together to make the rocks in the foreground. A nice, beautiful summing up of the whole story. So that, in just uh, a few words, is how planet Earth was made. And what I'd like to do now is draw some conclusions from it. So one of the first things that people want to know is, is Earth a common strict structure? And there are two ways of thinking about this. Uh, there's the Drake equation that was formulated back in the 1960s by Frank Drake, who was for a time our Dean of um, Sciences here at UC Santa Cruz. And he concluded that Earths are common using this equation. So here's, N is supposed to be the number of Earths in the galaxy, and it's proportional to the number of suitable stars. And then there are a bunch of factors here. We don't need to go into their exact definition. And each factor is something like 10%. And there are five factors. There's so many stars in the galaxy that with that number of factors, you predict that Earths would be quite common, that there'd be millions of them, actually. But another view, which is coming, I think, to be more frequent, and I share it, is the rare Earth hypothesis. And you get it really the same way, except you put more factors in the equation, because we're gradually beginning to understand that Earth actually has a lot of unusual properties that uh, characterize the planet as we know it. I'll just mention a new factor here to help you understand F sub m is the probability of having a large moon. Our moon was generated when Earth collided with another very large protoplanet, which is probably kind of a rare occurrence. That um, ejected the moon. It went in orbit about the Earth. And according to this hypothesis, the moon is very important because it stabilizes the axis of rotation of the Earth, which would otherwise wander all over the place and create havoc with our seasons and havoc with our climate. So for Earth as we know it, we need a big moon. How prominent is that? How po po probable is that? Probably not very because that was a rare collision. Well, there are five more factors, four more factors in, in this equation than there were in the Drake equation. And if each one of them is roughly a tenth, then you can see that quite rapidly you can whittle down the likelihood of having an Earth as we know it. And in fact, I've thought myself a little bit about this, and I've concluded, I've tried to list all of the key things that make Earth such a wonderful place for life. And there are 17 factors in this list. <laughs> I'm not going to go through the factors in detail, but each one of them is, um, is 
from you know unlikely to very unlikely. In fact, here at Santa Cruz, we've just been thinking about the last two factors here in this list, okay? One of the things we need on Earth is a magnetic field because the sun has something called solar flares that send out very energetic and dangerous particles. And if, if we didn't have a magnetosphere, those particles could come to the surface of Earth and damage the chromosomes and DNA of being suborganisms on the surface of Earth. Fortunately, we have a magnetic field which deflects. It creates something called the magnetosphere. It deflects those particles and keeps them from coming to the surface. Now, why do we have a magnetosphere? We have one because the Earth has a lot of iron in it. Iron is heavy, it sinks to the middle, and it's molten there, and it can support currents which generate an electric dynamo, which generate the magnetic field. If the core were to cool off, then the dynamo would die. So what we investigated in this most recent paper, which was led by Francis Nimmo, we investigated how do we keep the core hot? The answer is we have radioactivity in the surrounding mantle. The radioactivity comes from the decay of uranium and thorium, and you need enough uranium and thorium to keep the mantle hot. That sort of keeps the heat in the core. Uh, how much is too much? How much is too little? It turns out that there's a very narrow window of plus or minus a factor of two, and we are right in the middle. If you had less uranium and thorium, we would have lost our magnetic field a long time ago. But if you have too much uranium and thorium, that's the heat that, gener that drives volcanism. And volcanism, as we'll see in just a second, is the major threat to life on Earth. The great Permian extinction 250 million years ago was generated by a prolonged episode of volcanism, which leased toxic gases and clouds of dust and so on into the atmosphere. Volcanism is quite dangerous. So it's remarkable here. There's another Goldilocks effect here. We need exactly the right amount of uranium and thorium, not too little, not too much. Okay, so there are 17 factors on this PowerPoint. If each had a probability of 0.1, and there are 10 to the 11 stars in the galaxy, then the probability of Earth as we know it is only one in a million. So if you read in the newspaper that people are discovering planets all the time, sure, yes. But the Earth is not just any planet. It's a very special planet. Now then, let's, having understood all this about the Big Bang, its generation of galaxies, creation of planets, the likelihood of Earth, now let's stand back and look at our pro cosmic prospects going forward. And our prospects are, are very promising for continued habitability for a con considerable period into the future. First of all, our solar system consists of nice circular orbits that don't interfere with one another. The solar system is likely to be stable for billions of years. That's huge. Um, so the sun will warm eventually, and that will cause Earth to become uninhabitable. But actually, um, the first crisis there won't happen for the next 600 million years or so. Um, we could be wiped out by a nearby super ex nova explosion, but you can calculate the likelihood of that happening close by. And again, it's, it's small, um, maybe um, once in a few hundred million years or so. And I could continue, but I'll just end with the last entry here, this super volcano concept the biggest threat and unique amongst the entire list because um, it's not that unlikely and I don't think we know how to do anything about it. So at the moment, what we need to do is fund our Earth and planetary scientists to mm -hmm. understand volcanism on Earth and predict <coughs> the next episode. <coughs> okay, but the point is though that uh, hundreds of millions of years seem to be in prospect. 
So let's try to draw some conclusions, some lessons from cosmology. Lesson number one is that we got here according to the laws of physics and we are subject to those laws and must live within them. We're the first generation of humans to have a cosmic story that doesn't appeal to magic or the intervention of a divine being. As far as we can see, given our understanding of physics and a big bang as we know it back then, it will lead to galaxies like our own and planets like our own. And so there's, there's no point in thinking about divine intervention. We are here on spaceship Earth in charge and it's up to us to make it work. There's no recourse. There were no miracles in our past and there will be none in the future. Okay, and then the next lesson is that Earth will provide a livable home for quite a long time, 100 million years, maybe longer. And so we've been given a great gift, the gift of cosmic time. And are we gonna use it well or are we gonna squander it? That's really what I wanna talk about next. And I'd just like to make the observation that we're the first generation of human beings to know this about ourselves, to know our cosmic future, and therefore to be burdened potentially with the responsibility of using it well. No other generation in the history of the earth has had any inkling of this challenge. So this is quite a key moment in the history of human beings. Now, given the criticality of this particular moment in time, there are three things that we need to be talking about but are not. And I'll start by asking you to think about what is this number? <laughs> uh, I'm, I doubt that anybody would figure it out just from just looking at this screen, so I'll help you out. It turns out that this number, if you raise it to the power of a million equals two. So the point being that if our um, gross domestic product on earth grew by this number per year for a million years, our total demand on planetary resources would grow by only a factor of two. I am strongly of the opinion going to argue that we're coming up against the limitations set by our planet's boundary. And so a factor of two is kind of a convenient number to think about how much more can we grow? How much more copper can we mine? <clears throat> how much more water is available, etc. So the point of this then is that, in fact, if we're going to live here and thrive on cosmic time, which is of course the title of my talk, then we have to do so in a no growth environment. By contrast, what is this number? Mm -hmm. This 3% is the typical growth in world GDP for the last hundred years. And if we raise that to a factor of a million, it's 10 to the something or other, it's a huge number. This is the miracle of compound interest, right? So I'm just illustrating the other side of the coin that if we're going to live here for long periods of time, we, can't, we cannot much longer subscribe to or count on capitalism's target 3% growth per year. And that I think has profound consequences for what lies ahead. Okay, so let's talk about capitalism. Um, this is the rosy reassuring picture. Capitalism by its nature entails a constant process of motion, growth, and therefore progress. If you're skeptical about growth and you're thinking that maybe the planet won't support much more growth, then you would like to find that the economics profession is full of people saying the following. Interest and dividends are Ponzi schemes, both premised on future growth. Capitalism does not bestow growth as an option. It needs it 
It feeds on it and in so doing is devouring our planet. Famous economist X. Uh, unfortunately, I, I have searched and I cannot find statements like this by leading economists. And I think this is a problem. Mainstream economists are not considering the long-term viability of our economic system because it's just not fashionable for them to do so. This is a big major issue for me. If any of you know economists out there who would like to engage in this conversation, I'd love to have your feedback and meet these people. Now, in fairness, not everybody agrees with me. Here's John Bogle, he's the inventor of Vanguard no load mutual funds. He says it's not a Ponzi scheme. It's a scheme of free markets. Unfortunately, Bogle recently passed away. If I had a chance to talk to him person to person, I would say, look, it can be both. There's no necessary contradiction between these. Yes, it's a scheme of free markets, but paying interest is premised on the promise of future growth, I claim. And I think the statistics bear me out. Annual copper production has grown at 3.3% a year for over a century. And that's an exponential growth curve. And not only is our mining and demand on resources growing, but our waste production is also growing. Plastic waste has grown at 7% per year for the last 65 years. So both input and output, the, the capital machine is connected to nature and it's making two kinds of demands. It's stuff has to come in and stuff has to be processed going out. And the whole thing is just exponentially growing. It's a disaster in the making. Now, various folks um, would like to think that somehow technology will save us. And this is the notion of dematerialization. It's meaning that you can actually have the same amount of production but your demand on resources is less, absolutely less than it was before. And here's a paper that studied that in 57 industries. And the, they found that whether an industry was dematerializing or not depended on two things. First of all, it's technical performance, meaning how much more efficient could it get? But then there's also the percentage demand for that thing, whatever it is, uh, as a fraction of national income um, when technical performance is increased. And here's a plot of all 57 points. And you can see that uh, the desirable region in each one of these graphs is the orange region when technical performance wins over demand and not one of these 57 industries was actually in the absolutely de dematerializing region. A couple here and computer hardware were close, but the vast majority of points were actually very far from the line. So technical um, efficiencies and substitutions and so on, they, they don't seem to re-yield an absolute decline in the demand on nature if anything, it's, it's the reverse. And I, I would argue with people who say, well, technology will save us. Look, we've had improving technology for the last century or more, and yet uh, world GDP has grown annually at a rate of 3%. That's, that's evidence. Okay, so let's continue here. There's a word cloud, which kind of sums up capitalism. And it looks kind of cheery or at least neutral, banking, wealth, cash, et cetera. You have to really, I made several of these word clouds and you have to look a long time in them to see any evidence of danger here. Very, very small letters here, capital letters is, is the word crisis. But um, people's picture of capitalism is quite rosy. Mine is that it had a great run, but that run is quickly going to be coming to a close. So this is thing one that we should be talking about, but aren't. There's no global taking discussion taking place on the nature of capitalism and where it is taking us. Let's move on now to thing two. And that has to do with consideration of the earth as a system. And 
understanding how Earth works. Now, people have been making Earth models for some time now, and they're getting steadily better uh, with the passage of time, moving from left to right. People are adding more and more components to the model, and it's getting ever more realistic. This is how people make climate models. But still more or less missing in models like this is the people. And as our number of people get larger, we are a major, larger and larger factor on how Earth's environment is actually evolving, climate warming. So since it's hard to put people into a model in detail, it might be wise to step back and think much more broadly for a moment. And so these folks at the University of Maryland did that. They made a very simple model. <clears throat> there are only four equations in it. And there are four key components. There are two kinds of people, the elite and the commoners. There is an environment, nature, which supplies uh, resources and needs to be allowed to recover and process waste. And, and finally, there's also something called wealth. And wealth is managed by the elites. Only the elites get to have wealth. And whenever the economy produces anything, some factor of part of it goes to the elites and some go to the commoners. And the ratio is this inequality factor K here, which uh, you know, can, be, can have any value. I wrote it as a 100 here, just for the fun of it. Okay, so then you have four equations that relate the interactions amongst all of these elements, and you, you see, how does it play out? All right, well, here are some, some answers. Uh, once in a while, depending on how you choose the parameters, there's a so soft landing and a stable solution. But that is quite rare. Usually you're in highly oscillatory situation. And depending on the parameters, in particular on one, everything can collapse. Nature collapses, leading to the starvation of workers and ultimately the starvation of the elites as well, who depend on the workers. So there are some general principles that emerge from this simple set of equations. The existence of wealth is a problem because it allows the elites to ignore the plight of the commoners and deny the prospect of impending doom. It sort of insulates them for a while. It creates a time delay. And so they don't respond. They think everything is fine and it isn't. And then the other big issue is this inequality factor, K, representing the elites versus the commoners. And here's, this is very interesting. In this particular set of equations, if K is bigger than 10, collapse of the society is inevitable. The commoners starve first, but the elites starve later. That's very, very interesting. When you think of salaries of CEOs being a thousand, ten time, thousand times the salaries of workers today, I would claim that we are definitely in a regime where K is greater than 10 right now. And parenthetically, revolution is not included in this model, but if it were, the outcome might be rather different. Okay, so summing up, thing two, there is no global understanding of Earth as a system for harboring complex intelligent life and the instabilities that are inherent in a complex socio-economic system and how to tame them. And because we don't know that, we don't understand what Earth's ultimate carrying capacity for intelligent life is. And I think that's, that's a very important number for reasons that I'll come back to in a minute. But let me now first move on to the third thing, which is the ethics of the future. I need to take a little bit of a detour here and talk about human ethics as a, as a foundational topic. Where do human ethical principles come from? You'll get different answers depending on who you talk to. I think many people think something like this. God spake all these words saying, I am the Lord thy God, etc., etc." In other words, shorthand saying that 
human ethical principles are, they come from the outside. They come from a divine being who gives us rules and we should live by them. In the course of human history, the vast majority of people believe this. Now, others don't believe necessarily in God, but still think that moral principles are absolute. And Immanuel Kant was probably the most eloquent exponent of this. Do the right thing because it is right. This is the so-called Kant categorical imperative, which we've all heard of. Now, more recently, another view of human ethics is coming into view, and it's being pioneered by people like E.O. Wilson, who um, founded, uh, or helped to find, found the field of evolutionary biology. And here's a quote from E.O. Wilson, who recently passed away. Most agree that ethical codes have arisen by evolution through the interplay of biology and culture. Cooperative individuals generally survive longer and leave more offspring. Let's pursue that. The function, here's Dean Peterson, who says that the function of morality or the moral organ is to negotiate the inherent serious conflict between self and others. Basically, what these people are saying is that Human beings have a business plan. Different species have different business plans. Some live in isolation. Our business plan requires us to live in intimate contact with others of our own species. And moment to moment, we have to decide, am I gonna do it for myself or I'm going to help the people around me? Not only my children, but also my tribe, my nation, the world, etc. We are, this is an inherent, aspect of the human business plan, which is based on close socioeconomic cooperation. Okay, now here's an interesting, this is a little bit of a side issue, but I just found it really interesting, wanted to share. So this is a fellow who's a psychiatrist from South Africa, Mark Solms, and he asks the question, why, why do we obey? these feelings? What, what is the carrot? What is the stick? Um, and his, he, he, he points out that evolutionary forces, this is his belief, are communicated at the level of the individual organism in the form of feelings. And the good feelings associated with these functions is what motivates us to do them. Very interestingly, you can do MRIs on people having moral feelings and moral emotions, and you can see what regions of the brain are activated. And some of the regions are in the lowest brain stem. And by the way, alligators have those parts of the brain and react the same way in MRIs as do people. And therefore the conclusion would be living organisms have to make decisions. Moral codes, what we as human call our moral code is just the mechanism for making those, we are not unique. We may have more subtle, highly developed moral code, but a byproduct would be that animals way, way down share the same mechanism. Very interesting point, I think. But back to my main theme, um, somebody said this a long time ago, when I do good, I feel good. When I do bad, I feel bad. That's my religion. And that was Abraham Lincoln. I think he was out in front on this point as he was in so many ways. Okay, so with that as background, now let's think about the future. And are we going to save it? Are we going to squander it? Those are the words I used. This is a decision that's very much like trying to decide how I'm going to invest my resources today in myself versus my neighbor. Except the only difference is now my neighbor is not contemporaneous with me, he or she is in the future. So how do we think about the future? Well, one way is a utilitarian way. There's probably more future than past, unless we get ourselves into real trouble here. And since the future is big, there are going to be more people there. And if we're just trying to maximize 
good for the maximum number of people, we should automatically think about future generations. Why don't we? How much do we value them? Well, that relates to something called the discount rate. So we're familiar with this discount rate in the context of money and economics. And it's what we actually really call the interest rate, which determine the time value of money. So according to this picture, which we all subscribe to, it's part of our economic foundation, a dollar a year from now is worth less than a dollar today. <clears throat> and the difference is the, is the interest rate. So somebody says, I'll give you a dollar, you say when, and if they say in the future, you make them pay more. Why is that? That's a very deep question. There are many aspects to it, but one of them is, hey, if you're gonna give me a dollar a year from now, in the meantime, I could take it to the bank or I could invest it. Uh, I could earn some return on it at low level of a few percent. So um, I'm not gonna let my dollar sit idle. I'm gonna, if I'm gonna give my dollar to you right now, you better come back a year from now with at least what I could have earned by taking it to the bank and earning interest. And this is, um, the interest that the Federal Reserve has charged its member banks average over the last 60 years or so comes out to around 2%. This has profound consequences. If that's really how we discount the future, not just money, but the value of the future itself, at age 20, you are valuing your retirement years at only one third the value of your current year. Is that really how you felt about your old age when you were 20 years old? I, I doubt it. I don't think so. At a discount rate of 2%, future generations have essentially zero value, even though there may be a lot of them. Now, to some extent, this discount rate that we use is part and parcel of the economic system, but actually it's built into our whole view of the, of the future as well. People do studies on this, and um, all these clever experiments that psychologists generate to figure out how we think, um, instead of an exponential discount rate, which would be 1.03% constant in every year, we seem actually to behave using something called the hyperbolic disc discount rate, which um, relative to exponential devalues the near term and gives somewhat more value to the far out here, that's this red curve. But nevertheless, this is a detail. The point is, regardless of how we phrase it, we are strongly set up to devalue uh, the out years, extremely. So humans have a weak moral organ for the far future. And why? Evolutionary biology explains this. It's because having one was not necessary for our evolutionary success to this time. All we had to think about at most was a few decades. Our genes said, you've got to take care of your offspring. So you've got to set up conditions that will benefit them. Rare societies have talked about the seventh generation, but no society in the past has talked about a million years, which is 40,000 generations. We just have never thought in those terms. So this is thing three. There's no collective understanding of the origin of human ethics and its relation to planning the Earth's future. We need to have more conversations like the one that I just tried to summarize. Now, I think there is some evidence that human beings actually do care about Earth's far future. If we were all meeting in an auditorium and I could see you, I would be giving you the following question. Imagine Earth a thousand years from now. It's a smoking ruin and human, here's the key point, human reaction, human actions starting with our generation are responsible for the decline of Earth's habitability. Take that, assume that is true. And now the question is, do you think this is good or bad? And 95% as shown by people who raise their hands in the audience, 95% think it's bad, 2% think it's good, but when you 
quiz them. They think it's good because it's good that humans have gone away mm -hmm. at that point and maybe Earth can regenerate. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, a small number of people don't know, don't care, or can't, don't want to engage. So, but the point is, the vast overwhelming number of people when asked this question, they think it's bad, even though a thousand years from now, you or I will not be here. So I'm trying to attempt to understand why we have this feeling, because if we could somehow cultivate it more, allow it to bloom and flourish, maybe it could be the basis for a new morality for valuing Earth's far future. So now I'm going to say something um, really controversial. Uh, it's a new thought. I don't think I've ever heard anybody say it quite like this. Why, why would we value Earth's far future? And this is my attempt answer. I'm really thinking big picture here. I'm thinking that there are a whole bunch of things on a low level that we value, getting food to eat, taking care of our kids, okay? But Earth, a million years from now, a thousand years from now, that's, that's more abstract. That's on an even higher level of thinking. Why do we value things on that level that are not immediately practical? And here's my thought. Humans intuitively respect something called low entropy and its creative possibilities. So let me illustrate entropy. Entropy is when you take stuff that's very dispersed and put it together in a very organized way. And it doesn't happen naturally. The perfect example is, here's atoms in a teacup and they're very highly organized. Somebody had to work hard to do that. It took energy, it took money, it took the attention and input of human labor in order to get clay and silicon and glaze and paint and put it all together in the teacup. That, that didn't happen all just by itself. And now I drop the teacup on the floor and it flies into a million pieces. What's your reaction? Well, if it's your teacup, it's a, oh my God, I dropped my teacup. You're, 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 you're dismayed. And I am trying here in this little theory to get at the roots of why you feel upset. And I'm claiming it's because we understand as human beings, I think animals probably do too, that it is hard to bring together atoms from different directions and create something beautiful, wonderful, and organized. It took work, it took an investment. And when that is lost, we feel, uh, we feel disappointment, we feel sorrow. And when you think about the things that we grieve, every one of them, I believe, is of this nature. The losses that we mourn are all increases in entropy. And I believe we understand intuitively how improbable our earth is and therefore how precious. Low entropy, the creation of something complex, and beautiful even, is actually our ultimate, most abstract human value. So I, raising the question, on this level, we bolster our, our belief in our values with religion. Do we need a new religion that worships Earth's spectacular ability to generate low entropy enclaves where ever more complex and beautiful phenomena can grow? Is this really, Earth's ultimate importance to the universe. Earth can do things that, as far as we can tell, no other part, no other site in the universe can do. Okay, so I'm coming to the end of my talk. Uh, inspired by these thoughts, the sweep of cosmic history, the uniqueness of Earth, the creative possibilities ahead, it seemed to me that it would be good to create a futures institute that was focused on this story. There are a lot of futures institutes. Most of them are focused, I think, on near-term threats like uh, terrorism or um, automated weapons, drones, artificial intelligence, 
um, and, so, and so on. Of course, the climate and global warming is also a very strong focus. I'll come back in a minute. But um, this, this cosmic perspective and the uniqueness of Earth, I think, have not been picked up in any of the other futures institutes that I've investigated. So here are some things that I think we should be examining with our institute at Santa Cruz. I spoke of Earth systems models that involve the human component and with the goal of trying to carry, compute the long-term carrying capacity for intelligent life. Why do I care about this? Because if, if that number is very small, then why bother? Uh, what can two people do that's interesting, really? Our civilization now with its billions of people, it's just a, a fecund, it's a garden of constant newness and constant creativity. And that depends on having a lot of people. If you have very few people, you won't do as much. So if like, like me, you value the creative potential in Earth's future, you'd care about the number of people or our descendants um, who would be involved. So we'd like to know how many people the Earth can support long-term and more to the point, what are the choke points? What are the limiting factors and can we work them? Okay, now my next point is of course, studying an economic system that doesn't grow. I think I've made the reason and, uh, for that very clear. I've also stressed the fact that we really don't understand human systems very well. I think they're amenable to mathematical analysis. I think there are basic principles of governing a human society. For example, the K factor, the inequality factor. And I think we need to understand them. Otherwise, we're going to be the victims of constant uh, on-off cycles, collapse and, and regrowth. And then lastly, I think we need to understand our moral compass for the future. We need to understand ourselves much better. I projected my view from evolutionary biology that we're just morally, we're not too different from other animals. And the reason for our moral system is basically pragmatic. I would like us all to understand that and have that view because um, I, I think believing that somehow morals are divine, divinely inspired might interfere with the conversation that we need to have about how we're gonna value Earth's future. So part of this is trying to find out whether human ethics can grow, are they malleable? And can we grow ourselves into a species that loves Earth enough to save it? So now um, I'm just gonna leave you with a few parting, parting thoughts here. Um, and I'm hoping to promote a conversation here amongst our questions. So in my opinion right now, there are two imminent and dangerous thoughts to this acronym, life as we know it, Locky, life as we know it. One is the prospect of declining economic growth. What's gonna happen if the economy doesn't grow at 3% per year anymore? What's gonna to happen to pension funds, investments? What's gonna to happen to um, uh, the funds that uh, universities invest in order to pay their, their expenses? How would you plan for your old age if you didn't, couldn't depend on the fact that a dollar today will be worth more when you're 60 years old. This is profound. And then the second threat is of course the end of the fossil fuel bubble. I could tell you some anecdotes about the pricing of oil that really bring home the fact that we are living in a fantasy land at the moment here with cheap energy. Everything we do depends on cheap energy. Energy coming out of the ground as oil and coal are ridiculously underpriced. Every one of us has today at our beck and call the effective labor of a hundred other people in the form of the energy provided by 
the gas in our gas tank and uh, the coal in the electrical generating plants and so on. This is gonna to come to an end, either because we run out of oil or because we are actively going to have to suppress the burning of much of that in order to save the climate. So these are two things that are on the horizon. I think I have two grandchildren, they're aged eight and 10. I am really motivated by what to tell them within the next 10, 20, 30 years. How are they gonna prepare for a world that's likely gonna be really different from today? So it's very troublesome. We are not moving effectively to prepare for this transition and why not? Here's my opinion. My opinion is that we rely mostly on a laissez-faire economic system, we call it the free market system, to make decisions for us. And that's worked very well in the past. But right now it lacks the right levers because uh, it doesn't have all the right incentives. For example, it doesn't properly price climate degradation. And so how do you put incentives into a system? We have many examples in the past. Government steps in and it either sets regulations or it puts taxes. And in that way, it torques the system and drives people in the right direction. Um, but our government is really not doing that very actively. Why not? Very puzzle, puzzling because consider the energy situation. There are actual workable solutions that need to be thought about and planned. I've given you four approaches here to solving the replacement of oil and coal. Um, and if we put all of them to work, we could probably come within shouting distance, perhaps not fully, but shouting distance of um, having the same reservoir of energy available to us in the future as we do now. But these are not painless, they cost money. Let's look at the first line here, carbon capture. <clears throat> you can either take CO2 out of the air and sequester it, or you could put CO2 scrubbers on smokestacks. And that's more efficient because the CO2 um, density concentration is, is higher there and, it, and that's cheaper. So people estimate that if we um, produced energy by burning fossil fuels, but from this day forward, captured all the CO2 somehow, this is the addition to the energy cost that we would incur. If you put scrubbers on smokestacks, it's actually pretty efficient. It actually increases the price by only 15%. If you take it out of the air, it's more expensive, maybe 60% or even 100%. You know, this is small. The price of oil just doubled in the last few months. Why do we find it so hard to make investments at this level? Yes, it's a pain, but it's not catastrophic. We're dealing with fluctuations like this all the time. So that brings me to my final thought, which I hope you will weigh in on yourselves. The fundamental question, can democracies rationally weigh pain and risks? Because none of our parties is actually standing up and saying, hey, look, guys, we're in for a big transition. Let's start to plan. It's not going to be painless. Everybody is going to have to contribute here. Uh, but I've got a plan. I've got four things. I'm going to put them together. And we've got to get behind this. Nobody will be completely satisfied. Everybody will suffer some extent. But the consequences of not doing anything are truly diabolical. Why aren't our politicians speaking to us in this way? And I put it to you, I, I think the responsibility is ours. It's ours at the ballot box. And what can we do to wake up the country and the world? Okay, so... As I say, I'm ending my, my talk. Of, here's a good way to end it. This is um, a picture taken by the Cassini spacecraft, which flew around behind Saturn and looked back at Saturn in the direction of the sun. Beautiful, I mean, just absolutely wonderful picture. 
It's a picture of Saturn, clearly, but actually it's also a picture of Earth. So scan the picture carefully. You probably can't see Earth right away. I'll give you a little help. Mm. So that's Earth as seen from Saturn. Not very impressive. <laughs> pretty, pretty small. Um, a lot smaller than Saturn seen from Earth, that's for sure. So um, this could inspire yet another despair poster, I think. Astronomy finding out you really just don't matter. But I think it's clear from my talk that actually the import of what I'm trying to say is exactly the opposite. The Earth is rare, it's wonderful, and it's worth preserving. And so I'd like to end with this poster instead. Astronomy inspiring us to save the Earth. So I'll leave you with that thought and hope that I can get some good feedback from you and your questions and discussion. What did you say that you thought, what did I say that you thought was particularly valuable? And um, what are your, your opinions that might be um, divergent from mine? So let's have a conversation. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sandy. All right, so this is generally a group that uh, has lots of opinions. That was a pretty <laughs> whiz bang profound question, <laughs> set of questions you are raising there. All right, Hugh, you can go first here. Hi, Sandy. Um, thanks so much for this talk. This is great. Um, I just uh, was reminded when you were talking about the uh, University of Maryland model that they put together. Um, there was also a model put together in the 1970s by the Club of Rome. Are you familiar with that one? Yes, Limits to Growth. Fantastic. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's gone through um, three iterations, and I just read the most recent one. Um, it seems to me, when I read it um, in the 80s, I guess, um, it seemed to me that um, it's very sensitive to the assumptions that you make. Um, and... Um, I don't know anything about the University of Maryland model either. It does not seem uh, to include um, uh, 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 environmental pollution like the Club of Rome uh, model did. Um, so well, anyway. nature, nature collapses, and and uh, and that occurs when withdrawals exceed regenerative po possibilities. So it would be very easy to put in an a, a, a extra negative term for pollution. It would just sort of enhance that trend, which is already present. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, I just think that it's, it's very, very sensitive and we don't have a lot of information um, that could corroborate that model. Anyway, oh, I I, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, th I think we have millennia of evidence to suggest that the model is exactly right. I mean, what is the model of a human society? It's, it is birth, it is growth, it is maturity, and it is collapse. And, um, and that is the general behavior of their curves. So I think the moral of the model is that in fact, uh, in order to have a stable human society is, is very rare. It takes a fine tuning. It takes some feedback mechanism. They didn't put any feedback yeah. in. They didn't say, oh, our elites are getting too wealthy. We better start taxing them, you know? So it's, it's that very notion that I think actually is quite profound in even in their simple models. Very hard to find a stable solution. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, other, other questions for Sandy here? Questions or comments? Let's see. Come on, surely, surely we have some. All, All right. right, so let's go uh, Mark and then uh, Barbara. Mark. <laughs> yeah, I, I think well, one of the things that's, that's really uh, gonna prevent uh, us from acting responsibly in this fashion is because the elites uh, hold a great deal of power and they're, they're um, Financial interests uh, are to keep us from 
um, keep us from changing things in a way that, that uh, go against their interests. And so the people who own the oil companies don't want to see us changing, converting our economy to uh, renewables because uh, that means that they lose the ability to continue to enrich themselves. And they have uh, a great deal of power because of their, their wealth. And it's hard to find a way to, to wrest that from them. Right. Um, that's what I meant by not having the proper incentives. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I don't like to sit here and, and throw daggers at the oil companies. I think they're just behaving like people. Of course. Right? So, you know, they're not particularly more evil than the rest of us. But there's an equation which is unstable and the outcome has been to concentrate a lot of wealth, influence and power in their hands and they're using it the way people do. Right, so, but if we're gonna solve the problem, we have to, we have to un uncouple that. Somehow. Yeah, we have to intervene. And I, I think the only way, the only um, institution we have that's capable of intervening is government and government is completely paralyzed right now. And we may say that, um, oh, it's a problem in the United States with polarization between Republicans and Democrats. I sort of think it's deeper than that. I think it's a problem with democracy. And so I'm actually encouraging us to think that maybe democracy is not the right form of government for managing the planet efficiently over the long term. You have Which an I alternative. Know is radical, but <laughs> that's my thought. Yeah. You have an alternative that, that you have reason to believe is superior. Well, there are many possible, obviously, many possibilities. Uh, it, it, Singapore. No. <laughs> okay. All right, so I, I've got uh, Barbara and then Ralph and then Gail. Barbara? Thank you. Um, I am so thrilled that, that I heard this talk. I think it's just very, very informative, but it also speaks to the what we're facing here. I mean, I think we need to face this. What I wanted to say was that I was, I was, I feel so validated. I'm not an economist, but I feel so validated in the fact that you spoke to the idea that growth, extensive, continuous growth is impossible. It's impossible for us to continue to exist this way. I've always thought when people talk about 2% increase in GDP or 1.5, whatever it is, this is impossible. They're not adding it up. Every, you know, you have to add up to 100%. This is not, you can't get more than 100%. And this is just nuts. And I don't think that we, put it in terms of, of real everyday needs and actions and what, what is meaningful to us and what is going to serve us well. Thank you so, so much for doing this talk. Well, the question is what to do about it. Of course, of course, absolutely. And, and by the way, you know, here I am up here in Bend, Oregon, drove here in our car yesterday, consuming um, 17 gallons of gas. I'm, I'm living the life just, just as everybody is. And those big telescopes, they cost money and they live at the top of the technological pyramid. The very fact that I can tell you this story today of cosmology depends on this big capitalistic and technical structure that we built up. Right. We are all in it. And we're all, ca we're all captured, we're lost. We're all captured. So then the question is what to do? Right. I mean, I always believe in community organizing, but, but organizing for what, how, and when, and whom, and it's very com this is very complex. However, if we begin to think about it, attend to it, know about it, maybe, maybe there will be some fabulous organizers who will show up and lead us the way. Well, let me just express one little thought here. Um, I, I think there is... If we focused on the question of alternative energy sources as one of our near-term problems, and what I was trying to outline is that there are other, there are ways of dealing with it. They're not going to be completely free and clear and painless, but there are approaches. Uh, 
I think people don't, politicians don't speak honestly to people because the story has been so unreservedly negative and pessimistic. Um, if we could find some ground in our current political parties to emphasize the positive, there's something we can do, that would be a way to start. Actually, I'm thinking about California since California has indicated a certain willingness to endure some pain in order to create energy. I think it, it actually might be um, a bastion to start this conversation. Okay, now we would, we would normally sort of end our meeting here, but as long as Sandy is willing to hang in there, we've got a number of questions, so. Yeah, sure, the, I, I wanna hear from you. I wanna hear what you thought was new and different. And right. what's, what's the part of this message that should be more widely known? Okay, so uh, Ralph, you go next, and then I, I also see Nancy and and uh, and uh, Ron. Ralph, well, thank you for this uh, talk. It it uh, it brings up a lot of a, a lot of uh, interesting. Can you? Yeah, a, a, a lot of interesting questions. And, and my thought is that this is a question of time. You're dealing with what? seven and a half billion individuals in this world. And here is a problem which is global. And we haven't, we're developing global authority now. Uh, there, there, there starts to be, and this, is, this goes back just uh, 50 years, 70 years, global authority, United Nations, World Health Organization, and so forth. And these are very, difficult. It, what you have to do is change people's mindsets. And, and it's a gradual thing. It, it, th th that is the problem, time. Uh, uh, and uh, we're in the process of developing the institutions that can deal with this kind of thing. And uh, um, I see the urgency of it, but, but there, there's a time, it takes time to develop the institutions. And I wouldn't throw away either capitalism or democracy, uh, they will have to adapt to the new, the new, uh, the new situation. Mm -hmm. and, and you can't choose another, another type of uh, 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 financial um, organization or political organization, now, this will do it. It's a process of development and it's happening. I yeah. agree, I agree. Uh -huh. Okay, yep. uh, Gail? Thank you so much for your talk. I think you did a wonderful job of, um, of combining the social science and the science, which is one of the things I, I, I'm a social scientist and I'm always feeling like I'm at sea in the science, but you, you just made me feel at home, which I'm really grateful for. Thank you. Yeah, the, um, the point, or a couple points that intersected that I wanted to say, because I find myself at my age, and you know, um, feeling so damn helpless. And, you know, and it's like, I can see what you're saying. And it seems obvious to me, you're right. <laughs> you know, and my, what is it? My reptilian brain knows <laughs> we're in trouble. You know, I know that. And that, what am I gonna do? What can I do um, other than talk to my children and make sure they get a chance to see your talk? But um, what I've been focusing on is what seems to me to be obvious, and I don't know if it's true for anybody else but me, is that um, when you talk about, and then the people start growing and continue to grow in numbers, et cetera, until of course we've, like locusts or like you know the flies in the jar, we've eaten up everything there is to eat. So I seem to, I've been focusing most of my energy on um, how do we stop that exponential growth? And there are two things that you talked about that fit for me, and I'm wondering how you feel about that. One of them, of course, is the huge gap between the wealth and the poor. And of course, most people in the world are among the poor, would like to be at least among the wealthier or middle class, like we have had. Um, and I worry that once they get a chance to be like that, they will still be producing more humans at the same rate. So birth control 
and um, is where I'm putting all my money, my energy. Um, but I don't want to be considered a racist because I'm, you know, saying, wait, you know, the rest of you folks need to do, well, what, like I've done, you know, at least my, put my money where my mouth is. Two people is simply the all you can, we can afford. We have to cut the, um, the growth of humans because human mothers are going to do whatever they can to keep their children alive and thriving, no matter what that takes, it seems. Uh, I certainly would. So, um, and, but that is something the government could do. And in fact, in the last administration before this was going in the opposite direction in that we could provide at least for women, if they want to use it, um, easily accessible birth control. So I totally. just want you yep. think about that. Oh, I completely support that. Of that 3% historically, half has come from population growth and has, half has come from an improvement in goods per capita, what you might call a standard of living on average. Right. Yeah. So um, if, you, if you read, and probably you have because you're a social scientist, if you read prognostications about growth on the planet, um, population growth, demographers are estimating a peak somewhere in this century around 9 billion people or thereabouts. You know, that's kind of almost irrelevant because in my view, I didn't say it in my talk, the carrying capacity is way less than that. So we have to go down. We have to actually go down. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what and, I think. And how is that going to be accomplished in a graceful way? That's one of our huge challenges, right? Right. And of course, that would uh, reduce, that would cause a, a steady contraction in the economic system. That's an anti-economic growth. <laughs> well, that's that's the reality. You know, it's like that's we're right. running out of, of, re of resources and we're still growing, so. Yeah. That's right. That's just one thing to do, but that's certainly where I'm putting my energy. Well, okay. that's well spent. <laughs> Nancy? Hi. Um, Sandy, that was so interesting. And um, the idea that low entropy is the ultimate human value, I think is, it's very interesting, um, but um, I don't think it's ultimate. I mean, it's the idea of think, thinking of low entropy puts um, value outside of ourselves into um, a world that isn't really us. It's just around us. And I feel that um, a really, really high value maybe to go along with low entropy is the idea that we we are the future, that there is no separation, that if we could understand from cosmology what it means to be the intelligent life in this universe and to feel the flow of it, that would be incredibly valuable because in order to make a change in how people feel and think, there has, it has to be attractive. It can't just be threatening. There has to be something really seductive and exciting about changing the way that we feel. Like, uh, well, so, I mean, your idea that there might have to be a new religion, I'm a little scared of the word religion, but definitely a new, a new ethic, a new, a new way of thinking like that, I think is absolutely crucial and possibly the only thing that could happen fast enough because we're not going to think our way out of this. And I know that you think that democracy may not be able to, to plan for um, a decent earth, but no one else has been able to do it either. And Plato's Republic laid this whole thing out in the fourth century BC. How do you run a, a, a country or, you know, for that matter, a world without a philosopher king? Mm -hmm. and nobody has a philosopher king and there isn't going to be one because we're all flawed human beings. So what we have to do is somehow become a collective philosopher king. One thing I think you really need to add to your talk is the, is the incredible importance of women in this, that there is a feminist approach to, uh, to the future that's really different from this, from the dominant view that we have now. And, and I hope that you can put that in. You are a shining representative of it. So, you know, say it. 
Um, I think I, the most important thing is to make the new view attractive. And, and the way to make it attractive is to put us into it. So if we talk about entropy, it's outside ourselves. It, you know, scientifically, it's an important idea, but, but we have to be part of it. We have to realize that this is for us, that our, the whole importance of every single thing we do right now depends on having a future. I mean, if we knew that we would live our lives and everything would be the same and we would be happy and we live here in Santa Cruz with the sunshine and everything, but the day after we die, the whole earth would die. What would be the point of doing anything? Mm -hmm. What would be the point of raising a child or writing a book or giving a talk? Or, there'd be no point in anything because the future is what gives today meaning. And people, people need to feel that. And I think that part of our big job is to figure out how to bring that feeling home and not just think about it abstractly or, or in some academic way, but to really feel it. And that is where I think your idea of, of a new, whatever you wanna call the religion, really has to go. That we have to bring ourselves deeply into it and not just, um, just not just intellectualize about it. But thank you so much for your talk. Can, may I respond? Sure. Very briefly. So. First of all, the rest of you may not know, but Nancy and I and her husband, Joel, have this long collaboration and conversation on this topic that goes back decades now. And Nancy and Joel are, I think, among the world leaders on this topic. Mm -hmm. And you could see the result of that in the eloquent speech that Nancy just gave. And I agree with everything that you are saying there, Nancy, uh, but, um, and in fact, I, by emphasizing feelings as the reason for why we do things, I hope I'm playing 100% into your view that we need to have feelings about the future. We need to have a love for the future. And mm. I, I, I think, I, will, I'm not, I don't think your remarks are a footnote to what I said, quite the opposite. I think it's like both sides of the Oreo cookie, you know, it's, it's the complete view. Uh, and so I thank you very much and just want to support 100% what you just said. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to let Mark jump in here and then we're going to have uh, Ron and Sheila and then we'll probably bring it to an end. And I, I just want to mention that Gail says, says we don't need philosopher king, we need a philosopher queen. Queen, okay. <laughs> Mark. Okay. Um, I, I just wanted to add that, that I think there's really good uh, empirical evidence that one of the best ways to reduce the birth rate is to educate and empower women. Yeah. And, and another thing about, about uh, the time value of money, um, mm -hmm. we put solar panels on our roof and, and the payoff is about 14% a year, which is a hell of a lot better than, than the average interest rate you can earn. Um, just. Yeah. A couple Created of remarks. partly by government regulation incentives, by the way. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It, it wouldn't be quite that high of a rate of return, but it would still be pretty good. Okay. Ron? Yeah. Four brief points, if I may. N number one, I would hope that you could join us in Barry Bowman's capitalism class. It'd be absolutely wonderful to have you there. That's number one. Uh, number two, um, uh, you mentioned that democracies may not be the answers, but yet you urged us to go to the ballot box. That's point number three. Yeah. And then point number four. Um, I, I'm sorry, but I don't know what kind of government or system of government they have in Singapore. If you could, in 25 words or less, say something about that. A philosopher king. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Sheila, I'm going to give you the last word here. <clears throat> this is the city. Thank you very much. Your talk and the idea of an Earth future is, is excellent. And I think that is the way of the future. But I will say you stated you thought government me needed to make the difference. I believe education. Right now, right now. Right. No. I believe what you're doing, education, is the future. The young people are making a difference right now. 
-hmm. And I think something like Earth Futures Institute allowing students to participate. I feel very, very strongly that the educational system is the solution and not the government. If we educate people how to vote, but we also educate people about the earth, we will gain intelligent voters and intelligent people who live on this planet. Yep. Now, I have a quote that I use because... Oh, oh we, uh, Sheila, you somehow muted yourself, Sheila. I have a quote that I'd like to share with you that since 1989, I have been involved in sustainability when I was considered an outlier, unusual, strange. And it was by uh, Edmund Burke. Nobody made a greater mistake than he who does nothing because he can do so little. Mm -hmm. Good. And I used that constantly when I was teaching and talking. Yep. And what do we have now for sustainability? Look at Santa Cruz and where it stands, university. So I have great hope and I think that it will evolve and that the earth will survive because we will have more educated people willing to participate with great logic in making a difference. Thank you very much for those remarks. The most significant undertaking of the Earth Futures Institute is the launch this year uh, on a pilot basis of three Earth, uh, three frontier fellowships to provide um, summer internship funds for students to do interdisciplinary research work on topics of interest and relevant to Earth's future. We're just starting that this year. By the way, obviously Earth Futures Institute needs money. So if anybody <laughs> feels like donating or knows somebody with deep pockets, I would love to hear about it. And one of these fellows costs um, five to $7,000, a nice, Nice little lump sum for somebody wanting to do change the course of a person's life be a great donation. So let me know if you want to support that. All right. Well, so thank you very much, Sandy. That was just that was just fabulous. Uh, Fifty years <laughs> in Santa Cruz. What what a treat for for Santa Cruz. And uh, I think this this emphasis on the future is really an important one. I, I mentioned in my only newsletter article that they had this debate on campus with Sandy and two other physicists and the historians on whether this was a good thing to do. And they lost that debate. I do not understand why. <laughs> That's but right, I think if the only crowd had been there, they would have been a slam dunk win for Sandy and her team. <laughs> okay, so thank you, Sandy. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. I've really enjoyed this event and learned a lot from you. So continue to correspond. My email is easy to find. I'd like to hear from you. Okay. okay. And see you all fourth, fourth Sunday in April, April 24th. See you all again. Okay. Okay. Bye, everyone. <clears throat>